Hello, hello, hello. Uh, Big D here for a little master's preview on the Big D podcast. Before I bring in my special guest, please subscribe, like, and share the Spunky Spectrum Sports YouTube page. I know it's been a little bit, but uh, we'll back the day. Also, check out the Big D podcast on Spotify and Apple. So uh, joining us for his uh, major Masters preview is my buddy from the UK, Tom Jacobs. Tom, uh, how are things going in the UK today? They're good, yeah. I'm just about on the right time zone again after uh, after travelling back from uh, your home country, um, but in New York rather than Florida. But uh, got to see the Islanders play against Tampa Bay Lightning, so there's a little bit of a crossover there with Florida and uh yeah, I'm finally in sorts again and ready for the Masters next week. Yeah. Yeah, does that, you have a green jacket ready just in case? Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. I think I think it'd be nice to celebrate. Uh, you know, I, I can't remember if I've had a major winner uh, or I think I've gone close. I had Mark Leishman uh, in the Open Championship with St. Andrews. <clears> but, um, yeah, it's tough. It's, it's really tough to get these major championships right. You always try and spot a little bit of value. You know, you get some bigger numbers on the guys that, you know, you like to bet every week. But ultimately, there's probably only sort of half a dozen that can really win here. So you have to be careful not betting too many uh, too many losers. I got I got Rom in the US Open last year. So nice. <laughs> that, was, that was a smart move because I think people just wanted it to, to look elsewhere because it seems so obvious, right? But when it seems obvious, sometimes it is and uh, you, you stick to it. Okay, so entering the Masters, the, who who's playing well? Because to me, nobody's playing better than Scotty Scheffler. One, seemingly winning everywhere. Wins in Arizona, wins in Florida, and then won the match, and then won the match play of uh, Kevin Kissinger last week. Yeah, I mean, he he's the guy, right? And by the numbers, Cameron Smith um, has the best adjusted scoring average uh, since the turn of the year, but. He's played less events than Scotty Scheffler. So, uh, obviously, he won that tournament of champions and then won the Players' Championship on his last start. So, he's a he's a contender for sure. So, is Scotty Scheffler, obviously. And I think, I think the biggest thing for Scotty Scheffler this year is that he's got Ted Scott on his bag now, who obviously caddied for Bubba Watson for two of those Masters victories, um, or both his Masters victories, should I say. And, um, and Scotty Scheffler is now a three-time PJ Tour winner. <laughs> and this is the first major he's playing in where he's actually won. So... Such as his uh, quick ascent to the top of the world ranking, that uh, you know he's a completely different prospect this time around. He's already got was it four top eight finishes in major championships already uh, under his belt, and that, that's quite a uh, quite a feat for someone at twenty five years of age. Yeah, and the but here's the thing: Scotty Scheffler's going into the Masters not as one of the guys, but you could argue the guy with how well he's played this year. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of pressure as well, and you always. You always hear this narrative that world number ones don't win at Augusta and and things like that. And, you know, Tiger Woods done it several times. And I know Tiger Woods is a different beast altogether, and I'm sure we'll talk about him at some point. But, you know, it, it, I, I would probably, if I had to pick someone, regardless of value, it would be Scotty Sheffield at the moment. I would agree, especially the fact that he's won different courses because, you know, Arizona is different than Florida and Florida and Arizona are different than what the guys playing in Austin last week or what the guys yep. were playing in San Antonio this week. But Scheffler, Scheffler has found him, has adjusted well to any golf course. It could be 90 mile an hour winds or it could be, or it could be water, tree line, cacti, everywhere. And I think the fact that, you know, we talk about pressure, he's just one in his home state of Texas with number one on the line against, you know, Dustin Johnson and, you know, it's, um, you know, in the semi-finals, and then and then goes on to beat Kevin Kisner in the final. He's obviously a, a match play expert. It's that's quite some doing. So, um, yeah, I, I think he's got all the right games. It's it's the other guys above him in the betting that we have to talk about as well, though. Yeah. So speaking of other guys, what other what other guys are coming into the Masters? Maybe not in the best form. Yeah, I mean, you've got John Rahm, right? He's not he's the, the favourite on the betting board, and, and probably for good reason. I mean, he finished, I think it was 27th um, on his debut, and then he's just been lights out here. He's got four top home finishes 
and his last four starts at the Masters. He was one of the 36 hole leaders in 2020, um, and he was fourth after 54 holes in 2018 as well. So he's he served that kind of Augusta apprenticeship, if you like, and you know he's got that major victory at last year's US Open that we were just talking about off air. Um, that at the end of the day, he's done everything he needs to. Now he's got the major victory under his belt. He's got the Masters form, the only thing he needs to sweat is that passer and uh, he'll be absolutely fine. If only I could hit, if only I could make a few putts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you could, you could probably putt for him at the moment, but um, it's it's strange, isn't it, right? It's, it's everything's so good about his game. He's off the tee, is brilliant. Um, his temperament seems to be improving, although I don't think it's, you know, there. Everyone sort of says how good he is. Um but, it, you know, he still gets fiery and under the collar. But I don't think you're ever going to get rid of that, right? I think that's just part of his nature and probably what makes him so good. So um, sixth start at Augusta now. That's, that's historically quite a good number of starts before you get your first win. So, um, yeah, watch out for John Rahm. Yeah, I mean, we've, Masters has produced several, I wouldn't say great putting putter winners lately. I mean, but streaky putters. I mean, Sergio Garcia's never been known as a great putter. Adam Scott's never been known as a great putter. Last year, Fideki Masiyama's never been known as a great putter. Heck, even uh, <clears throat> DJ wasn't a great known as the great putter when he won in 2020, but yet he set a record at 20 on Nepal. If John Rahm can get one of those streaky putting weeks, Who's to say he couldn't win in 15, 16 under Paul? Because he can hit the ball a long way. We know what kind of irons and wedges he can he can hit. And just, just keep the ball in the short grass and make your putts. And all of a sudden, the Green Jackets going back to Spain. Yeah, I mean, like, it's... And I think the other thing as well, one, you, you speak about the fact that, the, you know, the volatility of putting, like you can just have a streaky one week, right? And I think he can absolutely do that. I think the fact he's lost that world number one status and had a week off to kind of chill on that is probably um, going to help that as well. But, but ultimately as well, Dylan, is that Augusta is such a difficult um, golf course to putt on that everyone struggles with putting. And I think sometimes that can kind of help these guys out. So if everyone's going to struggle with these fast greens, then uh, there's no reason why... Uh, you know, John Rahm wouldn't either. But I suppose the other guy, you, you, you've got Justin Thomas, who I think is is playing really well, um, aside from the putter, like John Rahm. Um, I think he's, you know, top five in the field in terms of current form. And then you've got Rory McIlroy as well, who is looking for that grand slam. And no matter how many times um, his dad comes on TV and sort of says how bad he is at the Masters and how he doesn't like the golf course, everyone kind of expects him to, to break that hoodoo and, and get it done. Yeah, I mean, it seems like some guys have got a course where they play really well at and a course where they're just not not in sync. And you would think Augusta and Roy McIlroy would be a match made in heaven. But in any way, it's been any but because remember the year Roy ended suddenly with a four-shot lead and blew it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. It seems like Roy has done everything. I mean, he played the full, what is it, this week, Valero Texas Open, and he's quote-unquote ready for the Masters. But, you know, we've seen guys, I mean, last year, Jordan Spieth won in San Antonio, then Donia win the Masters, but it, I don't know why. It's, it, it's almost mental to me what's happened with Roy and Augusta. It's definitely that. I think it's one, it's, he tries too hard for it because, you know, it's the one <laughs> that he wants to get, you know, it's one everyone wants to get right. But also, when you look at his record, he had an eight-shot lead going into the final round of the US Open that he won and won it by eight strokes. He had a three-shot lead going into the final round of the PGA, and he won by eight strokes. He had a six-shot lead going into the final round of the Open Championship and won by two strokes. Um, and then he had a one-shot lead going into the, the final round of the PGA in 2014 and won that by a stroke as well with, uh, you know, a 16 under par score. So I think it's just one of those things that he's not, he's not particularly built to grind it out like you need at Augusta. I think, you know, he can pile up those mistakes. He can get off to a slow start and then make a load of birdies and bunches and everyone thinks he's coming towards the weekend. But I think I think it's just one of those ones where you, sometimes you need to be a bit defensive at Augusta and, and he's probably not capable of that. 
Yeah, and you all and you always see Roy have one of those bad putting rounds where he is striking the ball so well, but can't make a putt wolf of you know what. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 sad really because his career and, and his ability deserves the grandstand. You know, it, it's it's incredible. You, you think about Jordan Spieth just won, you know, ties the yeah. from a Grand Slam. But Rory McIlroy is has been doing it for a long, long time. It's just how long it's been since those major victories. You know, 2014. It's been eight years now uh, since he won a major championship, and that's that's quite the uh, quite the break between major victories. Heck, Tiger went 11 years between major victories. I mean, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe. Roy, maybe this is the year for Roy. I think, I think, it, I think the slight difference is that. You know, Tiger had him four strokes, whereas Rory's just there definitely is something mental, like you say. And and also you look at it and he's got a really bad sort of playoff record in the European tour. Uh, he's got a mixed playoff record on the PJ tour. Like I think sometimes just under the gun. Um, I think I think once he's he's the man and he's playing well and he's leading, I think he's really good at running away with it. But I think when it's close, he sometimes um, gets caught out. So it's gonna be interesting to see what Rory McElroy turns up this week. He'll he'll be there, he'll be in the top. 10, 15, I think, at some point. Um, but it's just it's just whether he can contend properly. So um, one guy we mentioned who's may, rumored or potentially rumored or making a return to golf this weekend is uh, Tiger. So, A, do you think Tiger plays this weekend? And B, is Tiger's return what golf needs or potentially an added distraction? I think he's, it's always welcome to have Tiger Woods back, right? Like I think I don't necessarily subscribe to the notion that you, we need Tiger Woods in golf anymore. Like I think there's, there's a plethora of young talent. Uh, you know, we're talking about Scotty Scheffler as a world number one. We've got Victor Hovland, we've got Colin Morikawa, we've got Justin Thomas, John Rahm. You know, you, you've got all these players and guys that we don't need to rely on one guy coming back. And, and that's no disrespect to Tiger. He's changed the game completely. Um, and, and I'll always be delighted to see him on the golf course. Do I think he'll play? Yes, I do. I don't think he'll bother going there. Um, he's just actually put a tweet out to say that he's continuing his preparation and practice, um, and then it'll be a game time decision. So I think he, I think he's preparing to play. I think it's just going to be a disappointing week. I think, I think he will. He might scrape through the cut because it's one of the easier cuts to make. But um, other than that, it'll be tough. And you know, it's going to be a different Augusta National this time around. You know, it's two. Two holes that are being lengthened in an eleven and fifteen, which that's not going to help his cause. I know, I know, he still packs a punch, and everyone was really excited when he played the the PNC Championship. But um, you know, lengthening those holes, especially eleven, that was already tough. That could uh, that could really play into into the big hitter's hands. Yeah, I mean, Tiger used to be one of the big hitters. Now he's an average and, he's, and he still does hit it far, right? But it, it's it's just when you've got to concentrate so much on your leg being okay and walking around a hilly Augusta for four days, I don't know how much power you can generate off the tee as well. Yeah. Yeah. Compare, yeah I don't think Tiger's eating like uh, six strips of bacon, full protein shakes and uh, <laughs> six and three cheeseburgers like Bryson and Shambo. Not quite, is he? No, I think he's probably a bit more regimented than that. But I mean, what, what do you think about those changes? I think it was the 11th hole where they're moving the uh, the tee box to the left slightly, um, which is which is obviously a I don't know so I say it's a big change, but they're also kind of changed the the contouring of the fairways as well and widening it a little bit to kind of <clears throat> encourage some off off hole sort of shots where they're a bit more into trouble. Um, and then the fifteenth, uh, the thirteenth, sorry, the no, the fifteenth, like I said. Um, that is longer, but again, it's a par five. So will that change things too much? It's hard to know. I mean, that, that 11th hole is now going to be longer than the par five 13th. <laughs> Let's just say this. I bet a lot more bog bogeys on the 11th hole. If... And it was already it was already a tough hole, wasn't it? That that was the that was the <clears> worst <throat> thing about it, is that you know, this isn't a hole that you know they're trying to trying to make hard because it was too easy. This is a hole that averaged four point three, four shots last year. So, um, you know, I don't think the players are going to be too delighted that's got harder. I mean, but these guys hit the ball a long way now. I mean, you see a drive go 330, 340, 350, and especially with the 
Undulating fairways at Augusta. These holes, these guys can hit the ball so far nowadays. Length's not the issue. It's weapon. Yeah. We saw it at the Players' Championship. Well, if you get where weather made such a difference, you on the correct side of the draw, a la Cam Smith, you won. If you're on the bad side of the draw, a la Brooks Kepka, you you were playing, you were playing, you were watching the players on uh, yeah. Sunday and Monday. Yeah, it was tough, wasn't it? And I think I think the Masters has always been good <clears throat> at making it difficult, no matter how. I mean, it never looks like the the longest on the court on the scorecard, but it actually is. It plays to something close to seventy eight hundred, true, you know, because of the way the the fairways are mowed back into the tee box and, and things like that. So, it's always been a challenging test, and it's always one that the players get caught out. There's plenty of doubles and triple bogeys that happen, and um, you know, even like the par three twelve, which is what is it, just a little wedge or or a nine iron at times, and. You know, they still sometimes manage to put it in that water. I think it. I think Francesco Molinari is still recovering from that uh, that shot there. So it, it's got its it's got its uh, quirks to it, and I think it was already tough. So um, it'd be interesting to see how much harder that eleventh hole plays. I, th- I think, like you said earlier to me, I don't know that the fifteenth hole will be too much harder. It's already under par anyway. So um, all the par fives play under par every year quite comfortably. <clears throat> so um, that's where the players need to make their scores. So, from a betting perspective this weekend, who are you looking to put on your card? Because, obviously, you can't put everybody on your card. That would no. Be- <laughs> that, that wouldn't be beneficial, would it, financially? I think... I think <laughs> unless, they were, Sheff- unless they were all, like, 90 to 1. Yeah, unless I took all the long shots and maybe just chance myself with Larry Mize and Fred Couples. But um, Scotty Scheffler's 16 to 1, which is which is probably right touch and go as to whether I'd want to bet that or not um but I think it's you know reflective of his chances um it's tough it's, it's a really tough year because there's no standout I don't think this time around I think Justin Thomas uh will have his backers for for good reason but I think Brooks Kepka anything with a two in front of his number is always quite impressive at a major championship that always catches the eye and then sort of further down um the sort of betting board I'd be wondering whether uh, you know, Will Zalatoris can back up what he done last year and go one further. Uh, that would be exactly the same as what Jordan Spieth done. He went second of his debut and then won. Um, and, and then I think you've got to start looking at some of the, the veterans of the golf course. I mean, Bubba Watson's coming back. He he seems to be in good spirits, not with Ted Scott anymore, which is which is obviously a problem now. He's with Scotty Scheffler. But, um, and then I'm always a sucker for someone like Justin Rose. He He's destined to win Masters at some point in his career. Probably not playing well enough this time around. And then <clears throat> Paul Casey, Dylan, if we find out whether he's fit or not, I think he, he'll have a really good chance, but I'm slightly worried about that bad back that he had at the match play. Oh, man. Paul K- <sighs> What's with all these golfers and back injuries now? Too much too much power off the tee, right? They're just too, <laughs> too, hitting it too hard. And um, yeah, yeah, it's tough, isn't it? It's gone to the days where they could... They could be whatever the weight they wanted and just lamp around the around the course and you know hit these beautiful iron shots like a Colin Montgomery without uh, worrying about any stresses on the back. But um, I think if you went into sort of long shot territory and, and maybe first the sort of DFS plays and things like that, I think people like Siwoo Kim, um, he has a really impressive record here. Uh, quietly, you know, very successful Augusta National and Robert McIntyre could come back after finishing. I think it was 12th last year got his invite back that way. Um, and, you know, he had more birdies than anybody else in this field last year. So I think that's really impressive to see. And famously, you know, it, they, they loved the kind of the players like that. And, and I think he could uh, could go well. And lefties have proven very well at Augusta. Mike Weir, Phil, Bubba. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is always the narrative, isn't it? The left-handers can play better. It doesn't always work. Uh, you know, we end up back in the, the famous left-hander every year and, and it doesn't work out. But um, I certainly would be looking at him, uh, especially in DFS. So I think, is he 7,000 uh, in DraftKings this week or maybe 7,100? Uh, no, 7,000 is completely flat. So 7,000 for Robert McIntyre and 7,100 for Seawood Kim would be people I'd target in that range. But, you know, they're probably going to be fairly popular. How about another guy who's done, who's 
streaky, but maybe the right kind of streaky for Augusta. How about Corey Connors? I mean, he's done well. I remember he was, what, first-run leader after winning the Valero a couple of years in 2019, right? Yep, 2019, yep, correct. And uh, he's streaky. Might not be the might not be the best around the green, but we know what kind of a ball striker he is, and he can get hot. And I think having that streaky player will matter this weekend. I like him at a uh, fifty fifty. I think he's fifty five to one. Yep, fifty five to one. And then uh, about Sam Burns, Mister Valsmall. Himself. Yeah, I've, I mean, Corey Connors, Corey Connors is great, right? I think, you know, like you say, the ball striking, the putting, um, you know, kind of sorts itself out at Augusta. I think just because it's so tough for everybody, I think it can play into the kind of weaker uh, hands of people. And, you know, he's got back-to-back top 10 finishes at Augusta. It's really impressive. Someone that's come out of here and, and done so well. And then, um, yeah, Sam Burns is one of those ones that, you're going to find out how much experience counts at Augusta National because um, this is obviously his first start at the Masters. And I think he'd be fine. I think he'd be really good. Um, whether the odds reflect his chances, I yeah. don't know because obviously he's playing so well. The the bookmakers don't want to take too many chances on him. But, you know, 50 to 1 is a, is a decent number if you use that kind of odds checker grid and, and things like that. And you can compare the odds. I think 50 to 1 is, is fair enough on Sam Burns if he's someone you like. And if you want even you want even juicier odds, how about two guys at six, couple guys at sixty five to one? Joaquin Neiman, remember he won uh, Riviera, and, and I think Riviera is probably one of, if not the closest Colts comparisons you'll get with Augusta. Hard, fast greens. How true Riviera this year played easier than ever because Neiman shot him. <laughs> Neiman was just so hot there. Yeah, I think I think with with the Riviera, it's fifty nine uh, renewals of of Riviera um, of the LA Open, sorry, at Riviera, and thirty four of them have been won by uh, present or future major winners. Twenty two of them have come courtesy of twelve Masters winners. So you've got Dustin Johnson's won at both golf courses. You've got Bubba Watson's won multiple times at both golf courses, and then. You've got others, Ben Hogan, Fred Couples, Mike Weir, Phil Mickelson, Sam Snead, Tom Watson. They've all won at least one green jacket um, and all won multiple times at Riviera. So, um, yeah, I think it's a really good comp. I think, I don't know about Neiman. I think maybe he's tailing off at the wrong time. Um, and, and like you say, I think I think the fact that it'd be a bit more difficult uh, than maybe the, the Genesis was this time around, that that would put me off slightly. The other thing, the other person I like in that range and it's Russell Henley. You know, I think his odds are uh, really short compared to what we'd probably expect him to be. But he's 31st, 21st, 11th and 15th in his last four starts um, at Augusta. And he's got a great game for it, right? He's, he's really strong off the tee, really good with his irons, putting is streaky. Um, it's just whether you can envisage Russell Henley winning a Masters. Yeah, I mean, but Henley's playing really well. And if it's a low scoring week, I mean, there could be a little wind, could be a little rain. I mean, it looks like the what looks like the weather will be out of Augusta by Thursday. So there may be a little wind this weekend, but it looks like a if it's a seven, eight under pole masses instead of like a double digit, maybe a guy like Russell Henley could surprise. I mean if Zach Johnson could win at Augusta, or who who won the year that a uh, Spieth donated a few balls in the water at in uh, Danny, Danny Willett. Yeah, Danny. If Danny Willett could win at Augusta, Russell Henley's playing really well, and he's king. I, I think the only slight concern I'd have, and he played really well, didn't he, at the U.S. Open last <clears> year? <throat> uh, Russell Henley. He was. I remember how long he was leading for? Was it thirty-six holes or maybe fifty-four holes? Um, certainly the first 36 he was leading for. And my only slight concern is that when you look at all of the last 10 winners of the Masters uh, tournament, only one player has not had a win or a runner-up in a major, um, you know, in, in that span. And that was Danny Willett, who finished sixth at St. Andrews. Um, and, and Russell Henley's best ever finish in a major so far is 11th. He's never had a top 10. So 
for all his good skills and all his good, te- you know, statistically, he's going to jump off the page. And that's why people don't want to take a chance with him uh, in terms of betting. I would worry slightly that he hasn't been in the arena, uh, you know, for winning one. He was five under par. Uh, he shot four under par in the opening round of Tory Pines and then was five under for the next two rounds. So he, he led for 54 holes straight, which was really hard to do. Um, and then we kind of saw what was going to happen to Russell Henley. Uh, on the final day where he did struggle. He shot a final round 76, which, you know, it's been a long time since he'd contended for a tournament. And then he obviously threw away uh, the Sony Open not so long ago against uh, Hideki. But I I think, especially for DFS, he'd be a great play. Speaking of DFS, who do you think will be among the chalky options? Yeah, I mean... I think a couple of those guys I mentioned earlier, Siwoo Kim and Russ um, and Robert McIntyre, I think will be chalky because of their price. I think that Will Zalatoris will be very popular. I know he's 9,200, but I think, you know, in that 9K range, he's probably one of the more popular picks with, you know, fitness doubts over Hideki Matsuyama. Brooks Kepka has been in and out of form. Bryson's injured. Daniel Berger doesn't necessarily fit the profile of, of a Masters winner. Um, and Louis is always going to finish like fifth or like third or Louis, fifth in a major. Just yeah, so Louis, Louis will finish second or third, won't he? So um, <laughs> it's interesting because I think that Cameron Young will be quite popular as well. I think I think it's it's hard because when I've just listed off three players in Siwoo <clears throat> Kim, uh, McIntyre, and Young, they're all at the same sort of price. So maybe their ownership would be a bit spread out. But if you go down into the six k range and, and you want guys to uh, to get you through the cut. Um, I think that's when you're going to start looking at people, you know, like Biz Wiedenhout at 6,700, Kevin Kisner and Brian Harmon at 6,800, and Kevin Nahr will all be popular as well. I think Kevin Nahr's had sort of back to bar top, back to back top 15 finishes uh, at Augusta as well. So maybe he'll be a popular um, play at, you know, 6,800 or whatever it is. Yeah. And, and uh, with the cuts now, true, it's not the cut, the cut. Making the cuts not what it used to be since no. Augusta changed, but still, this is the easiest one of the four majors to make the weekend. But I think if Paul Casey's back is healthy, he's going to be chalky again. I mean, heck, Paul Casey's always chalky in majors yeah. because he's always like between 7,500 and 8,100, 8, 8,200. The problem think- is how healthy is that back because we won't know until maybe Thursday, and if Paul Casey just takes one shot and then all of a sudden, boom, I can't go, well, then you're done. It's really interesting because he was expected to be really popular at the players, wasn't he? Because he played well at Bay Hill through 36 holes and he had a really bad weekend. And I think, again, if Paul Casey had done anything in the match play, even if he just played three matches and didn't get out of the group, um, he'd have been really popular again here at 7,600. But I think Unless he comes out and says he's fit or we see him playing practice rounds or anything like that, I think there'll be some hesitancy uh, to put him in, especially at the same price as Corey Connors, similar price to Matthew Fitzpatrick, who I think will also be popular at 7,700. Um, you know, Justin Rose, 7,500. I think when you've got those kind of options around you, Bubba Watson, former two-time winner, 7,300. I think when you've got all those options around you, I think because there's an injury scare, he might not get as much play, but... People are sharp, right? People know that Paul Casey is a perfect fit for Augusta. He's shown it in the past. His game is perfect. I think he was top, whatever he was, 11 in all majors last season. Um, So Paul Casey should be a really, really good play. And and even if he was chalky, I think that would be because you've heard something um, about his fitness. And in that case, you probably want him in your team. So ultimately, who gets the green jacket? I will pin my hopes on Scotty Scheffler, and that's not that's not going to go too uh, contrarian, right? You know, I think that's pretty obvious. But I, I just think that <clears throat> everyone kind of gets in their head, especially in golf, that once you've won a couple of times in a row or three times at the start of the year, that you can't keep winning. Like golf is the only uh, sport where we punish people uh, for for winning, right? We, we always say it can't keep up. So um, I actually think I'd like to overlook that. I think. He can expedite his master's experience with, with Ted Scott on the bag. Um, so I think he's, you know, he makes all the sense in the world. If I had to pick someone based on, you know, just no odds, anything like that, he'd be the play. If I had to pick someone uh, as a bit more value, I think Russell Henley's interesting. I, I think 
I'd like to see him overcome those demons um, of, you know, closing out before, but, you know, he wouldn't be this pro you know, he could be 33 to one if, if, you know, if he could, if he'd close out a tournament recently. So I think he's decent odds. I think, I think he's okay. Um, and I say, I, I really, there's, cause currently an 80 to one uh, on points bet on Paul Casey at the moment, which, you know, if you hear anything positive, that's sure to come in. So I'd probably take a chance on Paul Casey as well. Well, I th- the Masters has has become the event where guys either end long major droughts or win their first majors. And this year, Xander Shoffley is going to get that first major. Uh, and I like that. Like, I think... I am probably the most anti Xander Shuffle person in the entire world, right? Like I, I genuinely think he struggles really to get it done. And that's not, again, that's not a hot take. He's, he's really struggled in the past to get it done yeah. over four tournaments, but he doesn't ever seem to blow it on Sunday. He seems to kind of knock himself out of contention by the time he gets to Sunday, right? He's done something wrong in the second round or third round or whatever. He hasn't pushed on when everyone else has like, if he can get to Sunday with a chance and, you know, he brings a ball striking that we know he has, then it's, it all comes down to that passer. And, and that's what it's always going to come down to on Sunday. But 25 to one, Dylan, is, is, it's interesting. I know, I think before he was always kind of like 16 to one, 18 to one, even 14 to one for tournaments. And everyone was like, it's just easy to pass on him because he doesn't win. When he starts getting out to that kind of closer to 31 number, um, I think you do have to take a second look just because he's so good. And so good at majors as well. How about the how about these stats for you? And Xander has finished top ten in half his major starts. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I think he's top five in half his US Open starts as well, right? And I think <laughs> he's got two third place finishes here already. He was second after fifty four holes here last year. <clears throat> um, I think he was seventh after fifty four holes and then finished second um, back in twenty nineteen when Tiger won. Never missed the cut. So it's tough. Like he's done everything. He's done the kind of, he shot the, the sub 70 round that you need to do. He shot 65 in the second round in 2018, shot 68 in the third round last year. So he's done everything he needs to do, Dylan, to serve that kind of master's apprenticeship, as I like to call it. I just struggle with Xander Shuffle winning a master's when he can't close out basically anything other than like the no cut events. Um, or the Olympics. Or the Olympics, which it's weird. It's funny because some people rate that really highly and some people think it's kind of a throwaway event and I don't know where I sit on it really. Um, all I would say is we don't boost CZ Pan and Rory Sabatini's chances in tournaments because of their <laughs> uh, Olympic effort. So um, probably wouldn't put too much uh, stock into Xander Shuffle's win. But he, his dad and him always talk about this kind of mental approach. Now they're they're facing it and what they're going to take and everything sounds good about Xander Shoffley. It's just now piecing it together. So I'll never say that he can't win one because it would be ridiculous. Like he's a top 20 player in the world. He's been a top 20 player in the world for well, God knows how long now. I mean, you, you probably know better than me how long he's been up there. Um, but he, you know, forever. yeah, it's just, he doesn't seem to finish that. I mean, let's, I'll oh, brought it up in front of me here. So, he ended 2017 ranked 25th, and then he's finished 10th, 9th, 8th, and 6th at the end of his last four years. So um, that's how good he is. That That is how good he is without winning the tournaments that he probably should have won as well. So you look at his OWGR, top 20 finishes, there's nothing outside the top five, and that top five was the US Open in 2017. So it's just ridiculous. Like he He's done everything you need to do. That, you know, One of my trends is that you need to have finished... Um, you know, first or second at previous major to have won here. I mean, as I said, Danny Willett was the only one that didn't. Um, and I think, you know, he's already finished second in this golf tournament. So what more does he need to do? He was he was one shot away when Tiger Woods won. Like when you think about when Tiger Woods won, Dustin Johnson, Brooks Koepka and Xander all, won, all finished second, all finished one shot behind him. And people probably don't remember that because it was Tiger Woods that won. Um, and Xander shot a 68 on that Sunday and, and gave himself a real good chance. So um, we shall see. Yeah, we will see. And hopefully this is the year Xander finally gets that monkey off, major monkey off his back. 
he is a major monkey as well. It, it, it is worrying for him because if he doesn't start to win, he, you know, I think you can always forgive people not winning majors, right? Like that's a that's a really hard thing to do. There's only four of them a year. You've got to peak at the right time. Sergio Garcia played in 18 Masters before he won his green jacket. So, you know, Zander Schauffele certainly got time on his hands, but uh, you'd have liked to have seen him win a, a, another tournament other than these kind of no-cut events. But we shall see. Patrick Cantlay is another one, actually, that, that the odds are kind of suggesting he's not as good as he is. So we, we shall see. All right. Thanks for hopping on, Tom. And uh, we wish you all, we wish you the best. And hopefully uh, you'll be uh, raking in the chips this next week. Yes, thank you very much, Dylan, for inviting me. And uh, I'm looking forward to England versus USA in the World Cup in uh, Black Friday, isn't it? So uh, that's going to be a big day in the, in the calendar not so long away. Okay, okay. Don't, okay, no shopping for you that day. <laughs> no shopping, just uh, just watching us win the football.